Great. Okay. Then I'm going to quickly start with the presentation that I have prepared. I'm going to time myself as well. Okay, so this is going to take about 20 minutes or so. Um, so just to get us started, um, before we talk about any topic, we should be motivated about why we want to actually invest in this topic. Um, and so, first of all, we might want to ask the question, what is the tidyverse? Um, so if you think about R, R is actually really clunky. Um, it's a programming language that has historically grown uh, that uh, ultimately goes back um, to a, a former programming language called S in the 80s. And being really old, it has a lot of quirks. And it's not necessarily sort of in line with a modern interactive workflows um, that are also reproducible and open. And the tidyverse is essentially a way of taking quirky, clunky base R and giving you a lot of functions that make everything much easier. Um, it's a way of sort of streamlining your workflows. And I think particularly it's cognitively easier. So base R sometimes is really hard to sort of wrap your head around. Uh, the tidyverse um, sort of helps you um, in terms of the, from the conceptual side and your code will be much more readable, I promise. Um, it ultimately goes back um, or is sort of centered around one person, Hadley Wickham. Um, this was actually his PhD thesis. Um, so uh, in his PhD thesis, he developed ggplot um, and uh, a few other packages that ultimately then grew into the tidyverse as a community effort. So it's a network of packages um, that all sort of nicely play with each other um, and all of them are focused on different tasks that come up in data analysis. So why should you invest into this then? Well, for one, it makes things easier, as I just said, but also it's right now arguably the de facto standard. So even if you don't use, um, like even let's say you're saying like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stay a, um, I'm, I'm a dinosaur, I'm, I'm staying a base R user forever, um, you're still going to be exposed to lots of tidyverse code. And so it's really important um, to sort of know about this, uh, even if you don't end up using it, but you should use it uh, really. Um, hopefully at the end of the session, you'll see why it's useful. Um, just to give you an example, here's a scary looking uh, piece of R code. So what this does is something really simple. It renames a column. Yeah, but if you look at this R code, um, and if you're like me, then you're probably looking at this and you're like, whoa, like I can't wrap my head around this or this is really complicated. It's doing some weird clunky thing where like you're getting the column names of a spreadsheet and then you have to index those column names and you have to nest inside there um, uh, something which says, oh, um, when the column names are equals to the name of the old column, and then you are replacing that with new column. If this looks scary, don't worry, because this is what we want to avoid. It's a sort of like lots of nested uh, function calls, um, lots of sort of hard to read, and it's not immediately obvious um, by just looking at this uh, at a glance, uh, what this code does. And the, the fact that it's just renaming a column, which should be simple, um, is sort of hidden uh, in this complexity. Compare this, to the corresponding tidyverse function call. Here we have a data frame that's called df, and we're overriding that with a renamed version of that data frame. And it's as simple as saying new column name equals old column name. Yeah. And so not only is this less text, yeah, so it's sort of taking this big code chunk and compressing it but it's also conceptually much more easy to read because it says rename, and that's a sort of easy to understand um, action. Yeah, what does this do? It renames. Um, and it's an operation that is operating on a data frame. And then it's as simple as saying, this is my new column name and this is my old column name. Yeah, <clears throat> and it's this sort of conceptual benefit that is really a, a huge advantage of working with the tidyverse because this code is much more readable for you as a human reader and your future self is going to thank you when you look at your old code and everything is sort of more understandable. So um, as a sort of uh, quick aside, my personal journey with the tidyverse 
um, is that I actually, um, so having had a lot of experience with base R and um, uh, uh, using base R for a long time, I was actually very hesitant to move to the tidyverse because it's like, I know how base R works. I, I know these functions and it's comfortable, isn't it? Once you understand something and it works, you stick with it. But there's a sort of limit uh, in the end where you're sort of at some point um, constraining yourself. Um, and it's worth at some point to switch, um, even if your old code that is clunky worked, um, to actually something that is easier. And I can say that I was a late adopter of the tidyverse. And it was actually through my friends who said, uh, you know, you can't teach base R anymore. You need to like teach tidyverse. Um, that I ultimately decided to invest into like, okay, I'm going to actually make my entire workflow in terms of the tidyverse. And it's massively improved everything, uh, everything since then. And it's also massively improved the way um, I teach because it's much easier for students to, to grasp um, uh, stuff that's uh, oriented around easy to understand actions like renaming, um, uh, transforming and so on. So uh, I hope that at the end of this, you will also um, embark on this journey and sort of really invest into um, adopting and switching your uh, workflow to be entirely in tidyverse because it pays off. Okay, so that's just the preamble. Um, very quickly, some of the basic points before we about the tidyverse itself before we get into the actual exercise. So the first thing to understand is that the tidyverse is a massive community effort. Um, and it's a network of packages. So it's not just one package, but it's a network of packages that sort of nicely play together. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna list some of the ones that we encountered today in the exercise, uh, just so that you have heard of the name. You don't have to remember this, but it is good to have heard about it once. So the Tidyverse operates on tibbles. A tibble is just a new name uh, for a data frame. Um, and you'll see lots of tibbles, but basically they're your average data frame uh, and they have some uh, benefits uh, that we'll see in the exercise, but they're basically just better data frames. Um, but the tibble is sort of the currency of the tidyverse. Every operation that you do, you will perform on a tibble and you will get as a result, a new tibble. So you perform it on a spreadsheet and you get a new spreadsheet as a result. So this is your sort of raw material to apply the tidyverse to. We will use read R for loading in and um, offloading data onto your computer. So whenever we interface with your computer, we use read R and specifically, these are two example functions from this. Um, so we'll use them in the exercise. Um, Read R is better than the base R uh, functions for loading. It's faster and has several other benefits. But really, um, the main workhorse when it comes to wrangling with data is dplyr. And this is a package um, uh, that is a really sort of very essential member of the tidyverse. And as this plier thing suggests, it's a thing that um, does operations like this um, with a plier um, to spreadsheets. So you are sort of like, getting rid of uh, columns, you're getting rid of uh, rows, or you are um, changing the content of a column, uh, you, you're performing an operation on a data frame or a tibble. Um, we will also use pipes. Uh, this comes from the Magrit R package. Um, they take some time to get used to and for thinking, but um, uh, I'll demonstrate to you the advantages of that. Personally, uh, for me, a core member of the tidyverse is the string R package, which uh, is for text processing and has lots of sort of string manipulation functions. Uh, as a linguist, I have a lot of text data, so this is essential to me, but it is actually really useful uh, in general. And then probably um, the thing that most people are drawn to when they think about the tidyverse is ggplot, which is everybody's favorite plotting package. And actually a lot of people who are programmers in other programming languages, they often resort to R when it comes to making graphs and ggplot interacts very nicely um, with these other packages. It's, so it's like, a, um, it's, it's a sort of nice workflow. And I will talk briefly about ggplot as well. Now, if this is like too many packages to remember, <laughs> The good thing is they're all collapsed into one package now. 
And so that is the tidyverse package. And if you have this installed, as this was in the instructions, um, so uh, if not, we'll, we can quickly fix that uh, when we get to the exercise. But basically, each of your scripts should probably begin with library tidyverse, loading the tidyverse package, and then you have the combined power of all of these packages available to you. So you don't need to worry about this, but um, library tidyverse is the thing that you will use again and again. All your scripts will basically start with this. Um, and I should say that the tidyverse Although this is the, the sort of core that you load when you have the tidyverse itself, what's nice about it, because it has such a big community backing, it branches out into this entire ecosystem of community created packages um, that play nicely together with the tidyverse. So just as one example to highlight one package um, that is not part of the tidyverse as such, but that plays or is designed with these principles in mind, is the tidy text package uh, by Julia Silger and colleagues. And that's for uh, text mining and text processing, which I use um, in literally every other analysis. But that's just one example of sort of this framework extends beyond the tidyverse. Okay, so what are the actual core principles? Now you know it's a bunch of network, a bunch of packages, but they're connected by a conceptual, um, a set of conceptual themes. Wait a second, just one second. I'm briefly going to close my email in the background. Otherwise, we're going to hear that sound more often. Okay, there we go. So the first principle of the tidyverse is the notion of tidy data. And tidy data actually is defined in the tidyverse as something very precise. Specifically, it's a spreadsheet uh, or a tibble where every column is one variable of your study, yeah, of your design. So if you have participant um, identifiers and their ages, then you have one variable that's participant identifier and one that is age. Every row is one observation. So participant one, participant two, and so on. And every cell contains one and only one value. And this seems really trivial, yeah, because you're like, well, I mean, this is just like stating something very basic, but actually a lot of uh, data violates these principles. So for example, you might have participant names with their ages in one cell. Um, and then that's actually two pieces of information, the age and the name of the person in one cell. That's actually two values that should be in two separate columns. And so um, another way this very frequently gets violated is you might have multiple observations, for example, on the same participant or the same country or whatever in your study. Well, if this, and they might be in different columns, yeah, like you might do an experiment with multiple data points for the same participant. And if that is in the same row, that would also be non-tidy data because those are separate observations and they should actually be in a column. So there should be, for each observation, there should be a column. Okay, that's tidy data. That will be the content or the structure of our tibbles. So everything then is using, um, uh, everything then is an operation on a tibble. So basically the basic structure of all the commands that we will use are something like this. We are, having an object that I call here my tip. This is your tibble, yeah? And you are performing an operation on that tibble with some extra arguments. And the output of this will be overriding the original object. So here we are um, uh, operating on my tip and we're saving that uh, in a new object called my tip. So we're overriding uh, that object. And the key principle here is that the input is a tibble, and the output is a tibble, yeah? So spreadsheet goes in, spreadsheet goes out. And that's different from a lot of the base R functions where oftentimes you're operating on sort of columns and then you are operating with vectors and so on. And here, everything is sort of organized around spreadsheets, yeah? And that means that this basic structure, the first argument of every function will always be a tibble, is the same across many and, and if not most of the tidyverse function. So for example, rename operates on a tibble. 
uh, a range operates on a tibble. So always the first argument will be the input data frame. Now, what's nice about this, if everything has input and output, a spreadsheet, then this lends itself to stacking operations. And this is where the pipe comes in. So this is something that looks quite unusual to people coming from other programming languages who are not used to the tidyverse, because this arrow, which is called a pipe, is pointing to the right. But the way to think about this is that you're taking this tibble and the pipe is sending it to the arrange function. Yeah. And because of that, the arrange function then does not need to specify the tibble again. You don't need to specify, you don't need to supply the name of the tibble that you're working on because it knows that, wait, you sent me this thing. So I don't need to know the name of the thing that I'm supposed to be operating on. And that allows you then to actually stack multiple operations where this spreadsheet is fed to this function, which is then fed to this function. You sort of like, um, creating a pipeline. And it's really like thinking about this in terms of a conveyor belt, yeah, where you have a tibble, you, you pipe it um, to some function that also creates a tibble, and you pipe it to another function that also creates a tibble. And so you can create something like, for example, um, you want to create a plot, but you want to exclude missing data before. So you can take your data frame send it to the filter function, which filters the missing data out, and then send it to the plotting function all in one go. And you can save yourself a lot of typing this way because you don't always have to re-specify the name of the object that you're operating on. That's the key advantage. And then the final bit of the tidyverse that I briefly want to mention before we go into the exercise is the grammar of graphics. Now this ggplot um, could be its own entire introduction because it's a big sort of uh, topic, but it's worth just um, scratching the surface um, of the basics um, because we will create plots in the exercise. Um, and so I just want to briefly explain what the gram of graphics is. So the gram of graphics actually goes back uh, to this book. Um, it's one of several sort of computational frameworks for thinking about how data visualization um, can be implemented computationally. It's not actually implemented in this book. And I don't recommend you to read this if you're not um, a data vis computational nerd. Um, it's more, it's quite theoretical, um, but it's worth knowing that the ggplot2 package is taking the principles of the gram of graphics and implementing them in R. And so you need to sort of wrap your head a little bit around that grammar. So it's a little bit like learning a language. You have to learn the grammar. Um, and in this case, you have to learn the grammar of graphs. So briefly then, <laughs> how would I explain this? So um, my metaphor for, for the way ggplot works is if you think about, if you know a bit of philosophy, um, if you don't, that's okay. But maybe you know that Plato was thinking about these, um, there's like an abstract um, perfect triangle um, or an abstract perfect circle. Um, and these geometric shapes, they're sort of living in this uh, platonic realm, yeah, this sort of like abstract ether. Um, and uh, they're sort of perfect uh, in this space. Um, so we have these sort of geometric objects that are floating in this platonic realm, but we need to bind them to the data to do something with them. So we, we take the circles and say, okay, I want to take the circles and put them onto, uh, let's say, um, my age values. And I want my age values to be plotted in, time, in terms of circles. So that sounds very abstract. The basic idea is you have these geometric objects, points, uh, rectangles, and so on, and you map them onto the data. You bind the, the platonic realm to the data. And the layer that does that is the aesthetics. So aesthetic mappings map geometric properties to data. So to make this more concrete, what are the geometric objects that you might be dealing with? There's all sorts of geomes in the tidyverse uh, framework. <clears throat> uh, most of them are associated with a sort of common type of plot. So for example, geome point creates a scatter plot. 
um, geome histogram creates a histogram and so on. Um, and these are the geomes and I'm making them here blue. So let's make this concrete. If you wanted to create this plot where you have reaction time, how quickly somebody responds to something as a function of the frequency of a stimulus, we process more frequent things more quickly. Yeah, things that we observe very often, we're very fast at recognizing them. And so the durations drop. Well, this is a scatter plot. So these points, that is geome point, and that will be the geome that we need to use. Yeah. And so if this is our data, for example, we have different words and their corresponding frequencies and the reaction times. This is our tibble, yeah? This is our the spreadsheet. Now we need to know what to plot. We need to map the frequency onto the x-axis of the point object and the reaction times onto the y-axis of the point object. And so I'm showing you here this with green arrows to highlight that it's these, the, the, the raw data is the substrate, and then you're mapping that onto the geome uh, so that the geome knows what in the data should it plot. Okay, um, so what's nice then, um, so yeah, so the actual R command then would look something like this. Um, I'm taking the data frame object, I'm piping it to the ggplot function. Yeah, you now know this. Yeah, I'm taking the spreadsheet and sending it to the next function. And this AES stands for aesthetics. And in this, I can define the X values to be equal to the frequency column and the Y values to be equal to the uh, reaction time column. And then I add the geome point to this. And that geome then knows what to look for in the data. Yeah, so it's so, sort of almost the reverse of what we have. Yeah, so in this graph over here, you have the data, the substrate. So you start with the data and then um, ultimately want it to be in a geome, but you need the mappings to sort of create um, that connection. Um, what's nice about this then is that this framework extends and you can add themes. You can add all sorts of other things into your ggplots. Uh, so they will basically, we're adding elements into plots. We'll do a little bit of that in the exercise. Okay, so that's actually my brief introduction. Yeah. Um, if this was a bit too fast, don't worry, it becomes sort of ingrained as you are typing um, and becomes more concrete then. But just to finish the presentation, I just want to briefly uh, give you reading recommendations for afterwards. Um, uh, this is a bit too early in this session, but it's good to do this right now because then I can finish the presentation. <laughs> Um, so there's this R for data science book um, that I highly recommend reading from front to back. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a fun sort of, it's, it's only focused on data wrangling uh, and data visualization. Um, but uh, I have worked for the entire book and I can highly recommend it. It's for free. So if you go to this link, which I will briefly post, um, I'll post it at the end of the presentation. Um, then you can actually work through all of the uh, sort of exercises and it's really good to actually take some time to um, uh, become more um, versatile with working with different data situations. And then um, there's tons of books on ggplot, <clears throat> but my favorite one is uh, Kieran Healy's Data Visualization, A Practical Introduction. It's a gorgeous book um, and it looks gorgeous, it's, it's, um, but it's also really principled. There's not that many, there's, there's, this is one of the most sort of principled introductions and it's very, starting from the very beginnings uh, to very advanced plots and it teaches you good plotting, I would say. And now um, in line with the uh, opening, just to say, I couldn't uh, take the opportunity not to do a little bit of shameless self-advertising. Um, but um, if you like the exercise that follows, and if you like sort of my teaching style, um, uh, the book is called Statistics for Linguists is also accessible to non-linguists. Um, it's generally written for sort of the behavioral sciences, but anybody can work with it. Has a short introduction to the tidyverse, but then focuses on linear models and mixed models. Uh, so it's sort of doing all of that, but using tidyverse style code. And um, I'll post this as well, but um, I'll give you a free version of the proofs 
um, uh, under this link tree um, uh, together with some other resources. Okay, um, so that was just a brief introduction, three minutes over. <laughs> so yay, um, let us now get our hands dirty with an actual data analysis. So I have this sort of like data wrangling or data carpentry. We're gonna do like some actual um, processing of data. And it's always more fun if you're working with data that is real. Mm. So you need to download the data. Um, if you've joined uh, since then, um, let me post this um, in the chat one more time. So, Um, posted in the, like I posted in the chat, this is an open science framework repository. And I'm just going to show this one more time uh, for some of you who might not be familiar with the open science framework repository. Um, you go to files. And then you click on this OSF storage, Germany, Frankfurt. And then you press, then once you click on this, this download as zip thing will occur over here and download the entire zip file. It's basically the entire folder in one zip file. And then crucially, you need to unzip it. Yeah, so um, otherwise it won't work. Uh, so put it in a folder um, and I'll give you a few seconds to set up. Um, don't open up anything yet. <laughs> Um, but that's just downloaded right now. Um, and uh, maybe in a minute, maybe maybe I, I'll wait 30 seconds or so, um, download it, unzip it, and then I'll proceed with uh, an explanation of what's what the exercise will be. And have a crisp. Questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so download a zip, unzip, <clears throat> and then don't open up anything yet. You can, if you still need some time to set up, don't worry, I'm just going to briefly explain what the data is. And then we'll together get into the exercise. Yeah. Um, so, what is this data that we're dealing with? <clears throat> so, um, the data that we'll be dealing with, it's, it's important to sort of go into an analysis with a plan. Yeah. Um, in general. And so, um, what we're going to reproduce uh, in this analysis is uh, in very simple terms. Um, uh, actually um, an old paper of mine. Um, and it's nice to sort of work with real data. Um, and what we're gonna test is a very simple hypothesis, namely that taste and smell words in the English language are overall more emotional on average than words for sound and sight and uh, touch. So if you think about it, for example, smelly, pungent, stinky, odorous. They're all really bad. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to find a smell word that isn't really um, actually about emotion. And then juicy, sweet, bitter, they all have very strong emotional connotations compared to, for example, color terms, blue, red, which are a bit more neutral. Um, and we're gonna test this hypothesis. So whether taste and smell words are overall on average more or less um, uh, emotional. And for this, we uh, will to use two data sets that we need to combine. We will get <clears throat> ratings for whether a word is related to taste or whether a word is related to smell. So we have a data set where words are coded for whether of which sensory modality they are. And then we have to merge that with a second tibble, yeah, a second spreadsheet. Um, that contains information about whether a word is uh, strongly positive or strongly negative. And 
we so our plan for the coming uh, exercise will be that we're going to load in this data set we're going to load in this data set we're going to explore the data a little bit so that we are familiar with what we're working with then we're going to merge it and then we want to plot this relationship between these two data sets and if we get to it um, these are the three plots that we will produce and in order to get to these plots we will have to do a lot of data wrangling and learn about tidyverse functions on the go. Yeah? But this is the, 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 these three plots we will create. So this is a plot of just the emotional valence ratings. Um, so they go from one to nine. One is the worst, like murder. And um, nine is the best, like vacation, actually, is the most positive word in this data set. Um, and so you can sort of see that most words are rather neutral. And we want to create this distribution graph. And then we want to create a count of the words, how many visual count words there are, how many um, smell words, olfactory, that's what that means, um, how many taste words, gustatory, there are. Um, and this is just the counts of how many words. And then ultimately, after we have merged this, we want to plot emotionality, um, where up means it's less neutral. And we want to hopefully see that taste and smell are the most emotional and the other modalities are somewhat less in their emotionality. So that's going to be our desired outcome plot. Okay. If you have all the data downloaded, then what I would li now like to ask you to do is go to the folder that you have downloaded and they are, um, I'm going to um, uh, do, 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 briefly share my screen of my folder. So, um, so there's in, in your folder, um, there should be um, a scripts folder, a figures folder, and a data folder. And by the way, this is really good too for all of your analysis to always set up these three folders at the bare minimum. Uh, create this folder structure before you actually start your analysis. Um, and you can then go into the scripts folder and <clears throat> there's two markdown files. So uh, two script files that I've prepared for you that have code, the sense underscore word underscore analysis underscore full contains everything that we will do. So I don't want you to use this right now because I rather want you to actually type it yourself, but rest assured that if you get stuck, you have everything available in this uh, particular markdown. So I want everybody now to open up the sense underscore word underscore analysis dot rmd. So not the underscore full version. Yeah. By double clicking on this, and then it opens up a markdown file. So. Um, very, very brief introduction to Markdown, just in case you haven't, uh, because like um, uh, Mario and Sophie said to me that it would be good to make sure um, that it's introductory. Um, so just in case you haven't seen Markdown scripts yet, Markdowns are like R scripts, so they allow you to write your code without executing it, um, so that it's like a recipe of your entire analysis prepared but they have the added benefit that they allow you to write plain text and lots of plain text as much as you want. And then the actual R code goes into these code chunks. Um, and you sort of, um, markdowns then sort of encourage you to provide more extensive documentation, which is really important. Um, in general, you should always comment uh, and write what you are going to do before you are executing the, the code. That's just like my, like, what I do is I always write what I'm going to do in and then actually um, uh, code. I think a lot of people are sort of prone to hacking away um, and, and then documenting after. And that turns out to be um, uh, oftentimes then you don't do it and so on. So it's best to actually comment first and then execute the code. So the R code always goes into these code chunks, which um, appear as um, with like three tick marks. And then this um, uh, open bracket says that it's R. Uh, so the, 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 the code inside this code chunk will be R. And then you can write R code inside this code chunk. 
Okay. So then, um, this is a markdown. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to first change the author. Yeah? Because you are not Bodo. <laughs> Most likely it's a rare name. Um, so uh, Oops, put in sorry. your name. Sorry. Yeah. I think we're not seeing uh, the right screen. So we're not seeing your R right now. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep, yep. New share, R Studio share. There we go. Yes, perfect. Sorry for that. Um, it's sometimes easy to miss with Zoom. So yeah, uh, then I was going to say, this is your code chunk, the, the stuff in gray. Um, and then you can write as much as you want, like lots of text. That's the advantage. OK, so in the third line, put in your name. So uh, if you're Sophie, put in Sophie, uh, well, I'm going to put a bono. <laughs> and then here, if you wanted to, you can change the date um, just to be like really anal about this. Um, and then you can already save this. Yeah, it's saved. Uh, you've already personalized it. This bit we can ignore. This is just always going to be at the start of any markdown. Um, we can briefly ignore it. These two dollar signs will be interpreted as a title. So um, once you um, complete your analysis, um, you can create an HTML file, which contains all the code and the plots all in one file, which makes it much easier for reproducibility. Um, and um, two dollar signs will be interpreted as a title. And then you can just write. And the first code chunk that we have is library tidyverse. So if you're going inside the code chunk, you can press run, run current chunk. Or you can learn the shortcut, shift command enter, or if you're on a PC, shift control enter, I think, uh, shift strg enter, or whatever the shortcut is being displayed to you there. And if you execute this, then, um, it's loading the tidyverse with all the different packages. Actually, here you have an overview of all the packages that are being attached um, as a sort of standard whenever you're loading the tidyverse. These are the sort of core members of the tidyverse. And you can ignore these conflicts. If they, you see red, that's not necessarily always bad. Um, just saying, some of you may see the output of this um, at some point, not in the console, but beneath the code chunk. This is not uh, a problem. Um, personally, I don't like it um, because I'd rather see this in the console. So um, I can um, briefly show you in case you wanted to, um, I'm doing a desktop share now. Um, if you go to RStudio preferences, yeah, our studio preferences. Um, I think on a PC, it's in a different, the preferences might be hidden somewhere else. I don't know where, maybe PC people can be help out where the preferences are. You can type it in the chat. Um, and then you go to R Markdown and this thing is the thing that you wanna untick. Show output inline for all our Markdown documents. So what that does is if you untick this, what this means is that um, the code from the code chunk will be sent to the console down here, rather than being printed under the code chunk inside the Markdown, which I think is quite difficult to sort of keep track of stuff. That's just like my recommendation. I like to untick this and then press uh, apply at the bottom to apply the change, press okay. And you may have to restart the markdown in case it happens again, because sometimes it's saved to the markdown. Um, but just in case, it's not the worst if you're printing it under the code chunk. Yeah, you can change it for your, for your analysis in the future. Like it's, you can still operate everything. It's just not as nice, but I will use the thing where it sends it down to the console. Uh, I think we're not seeing the R environment. Uh, not sharing the right screen. Tools, global options. Thank you. Okay. 
You see our studio right now? Okay, cool. Perfect. So then let's go to the next code chunk. Um, and soon you'll be typing yourself, but we'll just get the start up. Um, the next code chunk does something that I would recommend at the beginning of every um, analysis is you want to print your R version and you want to print your package versions because this is an important aspect of computational reproducibility. Packages change, R changes, and if you report a paper, an academic paper, or any analysis, really, you want to report version numbers. So if you execute this code chunk, then it prints down all sorts of stuff, but crucially, it prints down your R version down here. You might have a slightly different version, that's okay. Now you know which version you have, and then also the package version, yeah? And then let's move to the next code chunk, which is also an important aspect of actually more accountability. Um, so if we run this code chunk, shift command enter, yeah, shift command enter, this is printing you the citation for what you're supposed to cite um, for the tidyverse. And I think it's really important to mention this. You have to absolutely cite the tidyverse when you use it. Yeah, there's a lot of work that's been put into for free by the community, and this needs to be acknowledged. Okay. So, with this sort of out of the way, now we can load in the data. We're going to load in the emotional valence ratings, um, whether word is good or bad, and the sensory modality ratings, whether word is tasty or smelly, and so on. And that's being done in the next code chunk. This is lines 38 to 41 in the current markdown. So this is where I already anticipate some issues <laughs> generally happens. So if we do command shift enter and executing this, so see, there we go. I already have that issue <laughs> because I opened up our studio before. Um, I'm going to open up our studio like this. And I'm going to explain to you what's happening. So um, run all chunks above. So let me see where this works now. There we go. So um, what you should be seeing is you should be seeing something like this, something with rows, column specification, something like that. If it says, object not found, what that means is that <clears throat> your working directory hasn't been set to the current working directory where you're at. Um, the way markdowns work is markdowns, when you open up our studio by double clicking on the markdown, what that means is that it will set the working directory of your current R environment to where that markdown file is. So you don't have to set the working directory, um, ideally with markdowns. Um, and then from that point on, you can use relative file paths, yeah? So if this did not work, yeah, um, close our studio <laughs> um, and uh, just close it, close the markdown and then double click on the markdown file. And by double clicking on it, as R is being opened, it will set the working directory to the folder where the file is. And then it knows where it's looking at on your computer. Where are your files? <laughs> okay, so, and um, I, I use this as an opportunity to also um, tell you about this really awesome shortcut that is quite a, um, <laughs> lots of buttons to press. Um, but this is a shortcut that I can highly recommend that I use all the time. So on my Mac, it's option, command, shift, and P. <laughs> it's just like, like on a piano. <laughs> um, but you can also, if you forget this, just go, um, if you go immediately under that code chunk, you can run all chunks above. And then it will run all the code chunks that are above this. Um, that 
is really useful because you can't print the text to the console, isn't it? The text is uninterpretable as R code. So this will just run all the code above. And then hopefully you will have the sense and the val data frame now. We can check that this worked just briefly for everybody. If you go into the console, so click down here and type in ls open bracket closing brackets, and you should see at least these two objects. Yeah, these are the two objects that you've now loaded. If there's a long list, then you haven't, um, then then you have um, saved your working environment, which you shouldn't have done. Um, we can talk about that later. But um, this is now loading in. So we're using read underscore CSV. And notice that these two dots mean we're going one folder higher because we're in the scripts folder. We're going in the folder of the entire repository. And then we're going into the data folder. Yeah. And we're using read underscore CSV, not read dot CSV from base R. Yeah. So if you type in uh, sense into the console, yeah, interactively, just to check things. Type it in and execute it. You can see that it prints out a tibble. And this is, by the way, a nice feature of tibbles, which makes them different from data frames. Um, in data frames, it will always try to print the entire data frame. And tibbles, it will only print the first 10 rows. That's really useful because you generally don't want to uh, have all the data frame. And especially if it's like, really big, it can um, like crash or whatever. Um, and this is telling you it's a table with 423 rows and nine columns. And it's tidy data. Um, I guess we could say potentially it's also, yeah. Well, um, it's, it's tidy-ish data because we have um, one row is each word, yeah. And then we have ratings for how much this word is sight and touch and sound. So these are different variables. Um, and um, it goes from zero to five. So zero is it's not um, related to the sense and five it's maximally related to the sense. Okay. So the final code chunk that I've prepared for you before we get typing is the um, next code chunk, which I highly recommend whenever you load in data to sort of print some random rows and check some random rows. So you can go into this line and rather than printing the entire code chunk, you can use command enter to just, if you're anywhere in the line and you press command enter, then this only this line will be executed. Yeah, only the first one. If you're in the second line and press command enter, the second one will be executed. So what just, is, yeah. sorry, sorry, I'm just interrupting you with questions. Yeah. So uh, one person asked why some of the numbers are underlined in the table. Why are some of the numbers underlined? If you go up, like when you printed the table above, mm -hmm. and yes, I think you see like point, like taste, third, oh, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific explanation? Yeah, I think that's like a, um, this is like a rounding thing. Um, so it's like basically, um, it's war I think it's warning you that like um, this is. I, I actually, I mean, if I'm honest with you, I don't know on the top of my head. Um, so uh, full disclosure. Um, but I think this is because it's too close to the next rounding, and so it's sort of like um, being a bit cautious and saying, okay, I'm going to print an extra digit just for this one because it's like right in the middle. I think that's the explanation. But um, it doesn't really matter. This is an only a way it's being displayed. Um, this is a sort of this is how tables are displayed if you print them to the console. Um, it could actually be that like there's there, there's more decimals um, uh, in the actual data. Okay, but that's a good question. Anyway, um, so if we're executing just the sample underscore n function on the val data frame, what we're doing is we are sampling n rows. Yeah. And so size equals 10 means that we are sampling 10 rows. If you do size equals two, you can change it. Then we're just getting two rows. And you can execute this repeatedly. And 
this seems a bit dull, but I always do this just to get a sort of um, flavor of the data. You can see that this is word with good and bad valence. That's how this is called. And then you can see sort of like what the range of the data is. And it's always good to sort of do this. Yeah. Okay. That's everything I prepare for you. Ooh, now you need to get working. I have my, my code prepared. So let me see where we are at. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to create a new section in our markdown. So this section was called setup. And let's just call this section now familiarizing ourselves with the data. Yeah. So you can type this in. And I'm not going to type in the entire text that I have in the full markdown, um, but um, we can just type what we're going to do next. Let's sort our data frame by valence. So again, always write out what you do before you're executing it, because that then if you have a brain fart or something like that, and you don't know what you're doing, you're like, ah, that's the thing I want to do. And so then we now need to insert a code chunk. Yeah, we need to insert for like, I've given you code chunks before, now you need to insert one. So how do you do this? You can go to this plus sign over here and insert a new code chunk, and then it will do this. Or you can learn that shortcut. And I highly recommend learning that. It is option command I. So on a Mac, um, option plus command plus I for insert. On a PC, it should be alt plus strg plus I, if I'm not mistaken. Can you try this out? Yeah, try out the shortcut. There will be lots of shortcuts today, but just try to get used to them over time um, by forcing yourself to actually execute them. It's easy to resort to pointing and clicking, um, but it's, it's good to sort of actually force yourself to execute them. So anyway, however you have created your call chunk, we're going to use the arrange function. This is the first tidyverse function that you're gonna type in yourself. What does arrange do? Well, it arranges. <laughs> this is one of the nice things about the tidyverse function is that most functions have rather transparent names. And so remember what I told you in the presentation. I told you that every function operates on a data frame. So the first argument will be our valence data frame. It's called val. And then we can specify what column do we want to arrange this data frame by? And so the column is called valence, yeah? So we wanna sort this data frame by valence and that's the name of the column, yeah? You can actually also comma separate and then add more columns if you wanted to sort by one and then by another variable and so on. So let's see where this worked. Um, let's press command shift enter for running the code chunk or go to run yeah command shift enter and then we can see some pretty bad words sorry i take no responsibility for these words yeah um these are the words that are rated to be the worst in this data set and we can all agree that they're pretty um emotionally arousing negative words so let's make them disappear <laughs> by actually sorting it from best to worst yeah so let's sort it in descending order and for this, what we need to do is we need to wrap the DESC function around the name of the column. So this is also tidyverse function and it only works within the arrange function, but it's just specifying, it's telling the arrange function, I want this column in the descending order. And if you execute this now, you can see that the best word in the American English language, this is American English, is vacation. And 
this is just printing this either to the console or if you still have that option, it's printing it under the code chunk. But actually, why don't we save this? Yeah, so um, we, we want to save this now. And we do this by overriding the original valence object. Yeah, so we specify val. And then we are signing this val um, with the output of a range. So this bit, remember, like for those of you who don't know, the shortcut for this is option minus. It's the best shortcut in R. It's, you will use this all the time, option minus or um, alt minus uh, on a PC, and it is for signing. So we're arranging the valence data frame and putting it into the valence object. Okay. And then let's just briefly check that it worked as intended. <laughs> yeah. Um, in R, you should never believe it does as intended. Yeah, it's like a basic principle that you always constantly check whether any operation has worked. And you do that in the console rather than the script because you just want to interactively check this rather than sort of, um, and just check that val. If you type in val now, it should be from best to worst. Okay. Let me just briefly check the chat. Yeah, thank you for, yes, Sophie, um, exactly. Sample end seems a lot better than head for sure. Because if you have, if you're just looking at the head or the tail and if you have like a 10,000 um, row data frame, it's, it's sample end is a really good way of getting a grasp of new data. <laughs> and sorry, Sumit, yeah, lots of typing. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I have one question about sample? And it seems also to filter out columns, not only rows. It, it only shows, is it a built-in function or you wrote? This, this is one? a feature. Yeah, that's a good question. So this is a feature of Tibble. It's a feature, not a bug. Um, it's a feature of Tibbles. So actually, if you type in sense, uh, for example, which has many um, columns, notice that it says, for example, there's this um, exclusivity column that is actually in there that's not displayed right now. Because the way this works is that if I make this really small and then type in sense, it will hide all the ones that can't be printed in this window. Um, so one way to fix this is to extend your window if you wanted to, and then you would have all the columns. Alternatively, you can force it to print all the columns by, um, okay, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, by um, sending it to the print function um, and uh, specifying n equals inf. Um, oh no, uh, width equals inf. Yes, width. Yeah, the width of this data frame. And then it will um, um, show all columns. So this seems a bit clumsy. It seems like it's less easy for you to sort of see the data. Um, I personally think that it's actually a really useful uh, aspect of this where like it will basically show you only as much as it fits into your window. And if you wanted to uh, see more, you can override this by actually specifying, I want to see all columns or I want to see all rows. Does it answer your question? Yeah? Yeah, but in the, in the uh, sample N, Mm -hmm. When you called the sample n on this wide data frame, it automatically only displayed the valence. Oh yeah, but that's actually because there's only the valence column, isn't it? I see. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this case is actually doing the right thing, uh, where it's actually this is actually only two columns. Yeah. So don't worry um, if if this print thing looked a bit scary. Um, uh, so it, it, in most cases, this will be fine for you. But in this case, actually. Um, uh, this was perhaps a misunderstanding that I didn't cl clarify that this is actually just two columns. Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do now is let's create our first plot, a histogram of valence. Yeah. So we want to see sort of what's the range of positive and negative words. And we're going to use Option Command I for inserting a code chunk. Yeah, or if you forgot this, yeah, using that insert new code chunk button. And this is the first time that I think it makes sense to use the pipe. 
So we're going to use val, which is now our sorted data frame. And we're going to pipe this to the ggplot function. And the command for piping, again, lots of shortcuts, sorry, is command shift M. Or if you wanted to, you could type this out, but I highly recommend against it. So um, pipe is command plus shift plus M, or on PC, uh, it would be um, control plus shift plus M. Yeah. So we are piping this uh, valence data frame to the ggplot function. And by itself, this is not enough um, because we need to specify what in the data needs to be plotted. Remember these aesthetic mappings. And we do that with the AES function for aesthetic. And we specify if this is going to be a histogram. Yeah, we want to see a histogram. On the x-axis is going to be emotional valence. And then how frequent something is will be on the y-axis. The only thing we need to specify is what is going to be on the x-axis. It is going to be the valence column. Yeah. So if you execute this code chunk, command shift enter, it will create a plot here to the right. But the plot will be empty. And that's because we're missing the geoms. Yeah, we're missing what sort of geometric property should be on the x-axis. We have specified that valence should be on the x-axis, but we haven't specified in what sort of shape it should appear in the plot. And then we do this by adding, and this is a plus sign, we're adding um, geom underscore histogram. There we go. Why is it still occurring? This is not being up, updated, but yeah, whatever. There we go. Yeah. So now we have a histogram. So we see how frequent are very positive words, very infrequent, and very negative words, very infrequent. And we can specify a few uh, sort of Let's just add a few things to this plot. So one is ggplot is by default always plotted with these gray slabs in the background. That adds a lot of non-data ink. Yeah, this is, this is sort of ink or like material on the plot that's not related to the data directly. I personally like to get rid of this. Um, and we can do this by adding a theme. There are loads of themes. Um, you can specify your own themes, but themes sort of change all sorts of cosmetic characteristics of a plot, and there are lots of themes, but we're going to use, um, I guess, theme black and white, theme minimal, and so on. We're going to use theme classic. Yeah. So if you execute this entire code chunk now, yeah, run the entire coaching again. We have gotten rid of um, the gray slabs. It looks much nicer, a much clearer presentation. And then let's change the color of those bars. Gray is pretty boring to look at, isn't it? So we can do this by specifying the, uh, an argument for the geome histogram, because if we're changing the color of the histogram, we need to change that specific um, uh, we need to add arguments, optional arguments to that. And the name of the color inside the boxes is called fill. And you can specify any color that you want. Um, steel blue. If you want to know, if you wanted to personalize it, um, you can type in colors, open bracket, closing brackets. These are all the predefined colors in R. And you can take any of these that have like a sort of pre-specified color name. So I actually re recommend you to do this right now because it's always fun to sort of like personalize things, makes it make it your own.
And one extra thing that we'll do is, and this may not be everybody's taste, but just to sort of explain the difference between fill colors and color colors, if we specify col equals black on top of that, then you can see that the color argument is the line surrounding the boxes rather than the fill which is inside the boxes. Yeah. Okay. So this is your first ggplot. Let's now save this plot. Yeah. I highly recommend, by the way, like for some of you may um, export it to clipboard and then copy and paste it into a, um, into a document. Do not do this. Um, figures and data visualizations are also part of computational reproducibility. So you want to actually save them, um, including you want to have control over the aspect ratio and all of that. And you can do that by using the ggsave function. And ggsave by default takes the preceding plot, whatever is currently, uh, the last ggplot is opened. And um, you can then just supply the file name. So dot, dot, because we want to go outside of the data folder, slash figures, because we want to go from there into the figures folder. And then let's call this my beautiful histogram. Or whatever. You can check, give it any, any name. Yeah. And additionally, you can specify as additional arguments. So I'm adding a comma and then adding the width, let's say five and the height equals three. And you can play around with these numbers and check the resultant PDF or PNG, you can, uh, or JPEG or TIFF, it, all of these file formats are supported. So if I now press command shift enter and execute this entire code chunk, including gg save in my figures folder there should be this new file so i invite you to check this or if you want to do this in r you can type in list.files which is listing the files in the folder that you want to look at you can say hey i want to look at the folder the figures folder, yeah. So going up dot dot, and then into the figures folder, and there I can see, aha! I now have this file in the folder. Okay. <laughs> Dark magenta, pretty close to the R latest purple. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Cyan four is my favorite. I love this. Uh, it's great. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. D I hope this works for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Great. So. Next, what we're going to do, we need to move on at a bit of a faster pace. I noticed that we're falling behind. <laughs> um, but uh, let's do, or let's just call this data wrangling. Data wrangling. Yeah. So we've done our sort of first data exploration. And let's wrangle with this data. Um, we need to create um, a new measure of emotionality. So if we go into this valence data frame, yeah, notice that what we have in here is whether something is positive to negative. But what the hypothesis that I mentioned to you in the beginning, it's, it's about not whether something is positive or negative, but whether taste and smell words are overall more emotional. So they are both more positive and more negative. Yeah, so less neutral, far away from the mean. And we can do this by using, we can create a new measure out of this valence measure um, by using the mutate function. Mutate mutates a data frame. This is not the best metaphor perhaps, um, but basically it changes something about the data frame. So whenever you're changing the content of a column or you're creating a new column out of an old one, you use mutate. And being a tidyverse function, it takes the data frame as its first object, comma, and then the syntax goes new column name equals whatever you're doing on the old column. So 
For example, we could create a new column that I call valence underscore C. This is a name that I gave it. And I, this is just like my own uh, sort of convention that I have whenever I have a centered variable. Yeah, when I center a variable by subtracting the mean, then I call them underscore uh, C. Um, if you're standardizing, you might call them underscore Z. And so you can sort of uh, create your own nice conventions. And this column is equals to valence. Yeah. This would be boring. It would just take the old valence column. But you subtract the mean of the valence. So we're subtracting the mean from every data point. So that means that whatever was the number nine before, we're subtracting five. So it's going to be plus five to nine, plus four um, above the mean. Yeah. And if it was the number one, uh, then it's now minus, if you're subtracting five, it's going to be minus whatever below the mean. So we're getting mean deviation scores through this. So if we execute this and check in the console, then we can see that we now have a centered variable where we have subtracted the mean. So this is uh, vacation is now quite positive. It's three above the mean. And then if we go at the, um, uh, the bottom of this list, if I use arrange val by valence, um, then we can see that like, like these bad words, which I'm not gonna pronounce, they're really negative because they believe the mean, yeah? And so we can do a simple trick here. Um, one way of getting the average emotionality is just to get rid of the sign, yeah? If you just get rid of the minus sign, then this negative word murder is going to be plus 3.5. It's going to be very far away from the mean, but we're ignoring whether it's positive or negative far away from the mean. And we can do this by taking the absolute value. Uh, the absolute value gets rid of the sign. So let's call this apps val for absolute valence. And we're using the apps function on our new valence underscore C. Yeah. So if we execute this, this entire code chunk, and we type in val, notice now that we have the absolute value column next to it. Um, I would perhaps double check this with sample n or a range or something to check uh, that this worked. But um, of course, for the positive values, it's all going to be the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, notice there's a cool thing about um, mutate, which is notice that this func this line creates a new column called valence underscore c. And immediately in the next line, we can use that already. Yeah. So it's this nice sort of function that allows you to sort of stack operations also within the function. It's quite easy. And I would separate each one of those in a separate line for our readability. Yeah, you can check tail as well. Yes, yeah. Um, and Ronald, yes, ggsafe has an image res resolution argument. You can specify the DPI um, for like high resolution printing and so on. Yeah. Okay, so we're almost there to combine the two data frames. We have everything ready because we wanna look at whether this absolute valence differs by taste and smell and so on. So we now need to merge this data frame into the sense data frame. So let's write this out. Let's merge the sense and val data frames or tibbles. We're going to create a code chunk as always. And the function for this, yeah, so remember alt minus. Uh, oh, uh, let's call this, let's, let's override the sense data frame. Sorry, let's override the sense data frame because we have um, 423 sensory adjectives. And this is the basis of our analysis. So we want to merge the valence into that rather than merging the other information into the bigger data frame. Um, the functions that merge are called join. And there's all sorts of join functions. 
left join, right join, inner join, anti join, um, full join, and so on. But most of the time I use just left join. And what it does is it takes a left data frame and merges the right data frame into that. So the order here matters. If I want this data frame to be my basis and I want to merge the other data into that, then I need to put in sense, which is the first data frame, comma, val. Yeah, because first data frame, second data frame, left data frame, right data frame is going to be merged into the left rather than taking the val data frame as the basis, which we don't want here. So let's execute this. Notice that it tells you that it did the joining, the merging, by the word column. So any merging of data needs a key that needs to know what do I, what in this data frame belongs to what in that data frame. And what this function does is it will search for what, is, uh, what columns have the same name and then assume that these are the same information and these, this is what you want to match. This may not be the case. Um, you can override this. You can specify your own key columns, but we're not going to do this. Um, uh, that's just like the easiest thing is just to make sure that everything is named the same way. And again, let's just see that this worked. We never believe it does as intended. If you type in sense, there should be at the end, maybe it's not printed, like we talked about how it's wrapped um, in the output. At the end, it should be um, these new columns that are added to this. Um, so sense, you can see here, if I make it bigger, you can see that it filled the um, missing values with an A's as it should. Um, and then um, uh, you have this, this data that we have created that is matched based on um, uh, the words. So abrasive is a somewhat negative word, slightly below the mean. Okay. One thing that we might want to do is we want to get rid of the NAs. Um, you should always be careful with this because missing values can be meaningful. But in this case, we know that the only reason why they're missing is because they weren't in this other database and they weren't in this study. So there's no particular uh, reason to keep these NAs in. So let's get rid of the NAs, the missing values. So for this, we will again override our sense object and we will use filter. And what filter does is it filters rows. Yeah. So it's sort of saying, I don't want these rows. They don't go through the filter. So as before, we type in the name of the data frame that we want to operate on, the sense, any function in tidyverse, always data frame first. And then we need to state what is the filtering command. It could be something like I could filter word equals to a particular word. We don't want to do that. We want to look at, we want to get only those for which we have complete cases. That's, that's a base R function that we're using here, complete dot cases um, for the valence column. Yeah, so filter this data frame for uh, under the condition that complete cases returns true. Um, so it is a complete case, it's not an NA. And let's double check that this worked. We can now see that we have a smaller data frame. If you type this in the console, it's less rows, which it should be, because we've excluded the missing values and we have no more missing values in here. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Yeah. How would you do it if you wanted to remove rows wherever there's an NA within any of the columns? Yes, <laughs> um, a bit more complicated. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. possible, but it would have to be a bit more sort of extensive logical operation. So something like um, complete cases this column and uh, complete cases this column. Um, okay. I, so you can sort of stack this. Um, so it could be, so this bit is a logical command. It could be a, a more extensive logical command, but um, okay. that would be 
um, uh, would be quite clumsy right now. Okay, yeah. thank you. But it's possible. <laughs> okay, finally, as a final bit of this, um, this exercise, we will plot absolute valence. Yeah, so whether word is over or more emotional, regardless of positive, negative, as a function of this column, which is dominant modality, which is whether the word is mostly touch, mostly um, smell, and so on, of sensory modality. Yeah. And we will insert a code chunk. Switched on the heating because it's getting really hot in here. <laughs> so much typing. Um, we will pipe the sense data frame. Remember, command shift M to the ggplot function. And we'll specify the aesthetic mappings. So what are those going to be? If we want a box plot, yeah, where we show the sort of range of values of, of emotionality values for the five different senses, then we want the census on the x-axis. So we want dominant modality on the x-axis. And we want our new apps val that we have just previously created and then merged into this data frame. We want that to be on the y-axis. Yeah, so we're taking from the data, dominant modality, mapping it via the aesthetics to X and absolute valence via the aesthetics to Y. And then we add the corresponding geome. And the geome for this is going to be geome ah, box plot, yeah, auto completes. And so if I execute this, then we get this nice plot, yeah? So we now have a, an indication of the, the distribution of the range of values of up means more overall, more emotional uh, for all of these five senses. We can see that olfactory um, smell is the highest. And then we can see that um, the next highest seems to be smell. Uh, taste, gustatory. But this plot leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> so let's just do a few sort of tweaks. Um, one you already know, I'm going to add the theme classic. Much better, much less visual clutter. And let's add color. <laughs> so we want these things in here, these boxes, we want them to be colored differently for all the different senses. And for that, what we need to do is we need to create a new aesthetic mapping because now the fill will relate to an aspect of the data, namely what type of word it is. So we specify the fill equals to be dominant modality as well. Yeah, and I'm going to separate this now onto two lines so you can see. I'm actually going to put them all onto separate lines. You don't have to do this, but for my output, it makes it easier to read. Yeah, so the only extra thing here is fill equals dominant modality as an extra argument. And if we execute this, we're getting this. The standard ggplot colors, which are really ugly. I'm going to change that to this is profoundly ugly. <laughs> but for now, at least, let's observe the fact. Yay, we have colored box plots. <laughs> so um, the, there's, a, there's a few things that are left to be desired with this plot. So let's change the color of those. So we could hand specify the colors which might be a good option because maybe there's some sort of like intuitive colors for certain particular categories. But we can also specify a particular scale. And so this is added to the plot. A scale is a new element that is added to the plot, which has all sorts of scales. Viridis is a um, color uh, blindness uh, um, appropriate 
um, but we can use maybe Brewer. This is the so-called Brewer palettes. Um, and there's all sorts of them, um, but one of them, and you can look this up, like there's a nice sort of sheet online with all the different palettes. One of them that I like quite a lot is Spectral. And you need to add a plus at the each line um, after the first command, each line needs to end in a plus because you add elements to this, this sort of layered reasoning about ggplot. Okay. Um, and we're going to do two more things to make this plot prettier and then we're done. Yeah. One is we don't need the legend. Yeah. Because the legend is redundant because the labels are down here anyway. So why don't we, uh, so the legend, why don't we switch it off? And the way this is controlled, and by the way, this is one of those things where if you didn't know this, you just Google ggplot um, switch off legend. Uh, every programming is a lot of Googling. Um, e like even the most experienced programmers Google every five minutes. Um, so then theme, legend position. So this is controlled by the legend position argument. And this is, I find this a bit non-intuitive. You can specify the legend position to be on the top, at the bottom, right, left, and so on. Or you can just specify none. And then it will be a plot without a legend. If you specify top, you type in top in there, then it will be at the top. Um, like this. Yeah, and so on, but we'll specify it to be none. And then we don't need this X lab in here because, I mean, it's pretty obvious that these are five different sensory modalities. So we can add X lab and we just specify to be equals to null. And so if you put a null in there, it will just switch off that uh, axis title. Yeah, so X lab. Cont uh, uh, controls the labels of the X and the Y axis. So Y lab then we can supply a name for this Y lab. Um, so we could, for example, uh, rather than using our sort of idiosyncratic name here, if we wanted to publish this or put this in a paper, we can write out absolute valence. Yeah. And then, um, that's it for now. Um, so just to say that in the markdown, there's tons more stuff. So I actually recommend you, maybe not tonight, it's pretty late, <laughs> um, but there's, there's all sorts of other things like computing means, um, um, all sorts of our filtering and select operations, a few functions that we haven't talked about. But they are um, in the markdown. You can maybe look at them at some point in the, the remainder of the week. Um, and sort of, I, I highly recommend you now that you've sort of had your uh, steps with this analysis, then to actually go to the markdown and work through it. And then after that, the R for data science book is your go-to friend. Okay. So yeah, that was the, the exercise. Thank you so much. Um, we have about maybe 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, and let's open up the discussion. And I'll stop the recording now. So you can okay. ask any question. <laughs> <laughs>